Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. This short study, I'm going to introduce you to the Bible verse that changes everything. Quite the claim. So I'm going to show you the verse that changes everything, and I'll talk more about what everything is. But to do this, to start this short study of the verse that changes everything, we've got to read all 32 verses of chapter 21 of the book of Ezekiel. You are about to take a test. I'm going to read quickly all 32 verses of chapter 21 of Ezekiel, and then you are going to tell me, this king of Babylon that's mentioned in Ezekiel 21 that comes against Jerusalem and, and makes Jerusalem fall. It falls to this king of Babylon. Okay? My question to you is, here's the test that I'm giving you today. This king of Babylon that takes Jerusalem away from Israel, is it... The event that happened to Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem during the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, right, when he came against Jerusalem, is that what this chapter is about? That's choice number one. Choice number two, this king of Babylon that takes Jerusalem away from Israel is... Uh, somehow talking about 70 A.D. when Jerusalem fell at the hands of the Roman Empire. You might say, well, that's an obvious no. Well, don't, don't be so sure. Those two choices, but I gave you two choices where Jerusalem fell. And now your third choice is that this fall of Ju Jerusalem by the hands of King of Babylon has nothing to do with a historical fall of, ba uh, fall of Jerusalem, but it actually has to do with our very near future. And if that's the case, then we got to figure out who this coming king of Babylon is. So, there's the test I lay before you. I'm going to read these 32 verses quickly, and then you're going to tell me this fall of Jerusalem at the hands of this king of Babylon, all mentioned in this one chapter, which is it? The fall of Jerusalem during the days of King Nebuchadnezzar, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, or is this a future fall of Jerusalem by a future king of Babylon? Which is it? And what might make this even harder is if you know the other chapters in the book of Ezekiel. That might even muddy the waters a little bit more for you. Here we go. Let's see how you do. But again, the subject is the verse that changes everything. I'm using the New King James Version. I suggest you use it when studying the 70th week of Daniel. And in this short study, you'll see why. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem. Preach against the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath, and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword shall go out of its sheath against all flesh from south to north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return any more. Sigh, therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart, and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. And it shall be when they say to you, Why are you sighing that you shall answer? Because of the news. When it comes, every heart will melt. All hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint. And all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord God. 
Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Say, The sword, a sword is sharpened, and also polished, sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Should we then make mirth? It despises the scepter of my son, as it does all wood. And he has given it to be polished, that it may be handled. The sword is sharp. This sword is sharpened, and it is polished to be given into the hand of the slayer. Cry and wail, son of man, for it will be against my people, against all the princes of Israel. Tares, including the sword, will be against my people. Therefore strike your thigh. Because it is a testing, and what if the sword despises even the scepter? The scepter shall be no more, says the Lord God. You, therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The third time let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasp for slaughter. Swords at the ready, thrust right, set your blade, thrust left, wherever your edge is ordered. I also will beat my fist together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, And son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Both of them shall go from the same land. Make a sign, put it at the head of the road to the city. Appoint a road for the sword to go to Rabbah of the Ammonites, and to Judah, and to fortify Jerusalem. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road, at the fork of the two roads, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the images, he looks at the liver. In his right hand is the divination for Jerusalem, to set up battering rams, to call for a slaughter, to lift the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to heap up a siege mound, and to build a wall. And it will be to them like a false divination, in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths with them, but he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may be taken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, and that your transgressions are uncovered, so that in all your doings your sin, sins appear, because you have come to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. Now to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Thus saith the Lord God, Remove the turban and take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and exalt and humble the exalted. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall no longer, it shall be no longer until he comes who writes it is, and I will give it to him. A sword against the Ammonites. And you, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God concerning the Ammonites, and concerning their reproach, and say, A sword, a sword is drawn, polished for slaughter, for consuming, for flashing, while they see false visions for you, while they divine a lie to you, to bring to you the necks of the wicked, the slain, whose, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Return to its sheath, I will judge you in the place where you were created, in the land of your nativity. I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath, and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skillful to destroy. And you shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land. You shall not be remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken." All right, what's your answer? This king of Babylon that was mentioned once during chapter 21 in regards to the sword coming against Jerusalem, and then at the end we saw coming against uh, the Ammonites or the people of Ammon, the capital city of Jordan today. 
So what's your answer? Is it King uh, Nebuchadnezzar? Is he the king of Babylon that's spoken of here in this chapter? Or is it uh, the Roman Empire acting like a king of Babylon coming against Jerusalem at 70 AD? Or is this about a future king of Babylon that comes against Jerusalem and takes it uh, during the 70th week of Daniel? Which is what Zechariah 14 talks about. Is Jerusalem shall be taken. You see it right here? Zechariah 14 is a famous uh, chapter in regards to the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ descends from heaven in verse 3. So, you have the three choices. What's your answer? Wow, you all got it right. <laughs> I wish. Okay, the answer is, and I'll be able to prove it, the answer is choice three. This king of Babylon is not King Nebuchadnezzar, and it's not the Roman Empire in 70 AD. This is about the 70th week of Daniel um, coming of, are you ready for this? Ezekiel gives you your answer in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here is this king of Babylon that Ezekiel 21 is referring to, up through the first 27 verses. It is Gog of the land of Magog. Where is Magog? Al-Mazil, or Al-Mazul, Iraq, ancient Nineveh. We call it Mosul today. But the Islamic world calls it Al-Mazil. That's Magog. Gog. And you might say, well, how do you prove that? Nahum 111. Nahum 111 says that he'll come forth. He shall come forth. The one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor, a vile one, he shall come forth from Nineveh. Al-Mazil, Iraq. That's Magog. So, back to Ezekiel 21. Now, you might say, okay, you tied in Ezekiel 38, but where's this verse that you spoke about at the beginning that changes everything? Good question. Let me show you. So, first of all, you need to realize these first 27 verses are about phase one of the coming day of the Lord. Right? That second half of the 70th week of Daniel. Phase one. That's what the first 27 verses are about. And then the remainder of chapter 21, from 28 to 32, that's about the wrath of the Lamb when Jesus comes and blows fire and brimstone, right? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Get it? Wrath of the Lamb. That's phase two of the day of the Lord. Phase one is the wrath of him who sits on the throne. In other words, 28 begins at the seventh bowl, battle of the great day of God Almighty. These first 27 verses are the first six trumpets. Okay, actually the first seven trumpets, or you could say the first six trumpets and the six bowls of the seventh trumpet. Okay, that's what's going on. Now, exactly during the trumpets, when does the siege of Jerusalem begin? I believe it doesn't really begin until the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet being uh, Ezekiel 3 and 4's 390 days, and the bowls of wrath being Ezekiel 3 and 4's 40 days okay, of uh, Judah paying for their iniquities. So... And we are in the book of Ezekiel. Where is the verse? It's right here. This is the verse, brothers and sisters, that not only proves my point about this chapter, but it also, listen to me, brothers and sisters, please. This verse proves what I have been saying for five years now in regards to the vast majority of chapters between Isaiah to Malachi are not, the, the primary audience is not people of the past. It's us. This is a, these books, Isaiah all the way to Malachi, is about what is a, going to happen at the appointed time of the end. It's about to begin. 
Okay, we'll have the beginning of sorrows first. We'll have the fifth seal period test on Israel. And then, boom, at the sixth seal comes the day of the Lord, phase one. Followed by the seventh bowl, phase two, when Jesus is here. But that's when Jordan gets judged, when Jesus is here at the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And we see that in Daniel 11, uh, verses 41, 42, 43. Jordan doesn't get judged or receive its punishment. When the king of Babylon comes, okay, during the, the trumpet judgments, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jordan get, doesn't get judged then. That's how I can say at verse 28, we it's still the day of the Lord, but it transitions into uh, the battle of the great day of God Almighty beginning at the seventh bowl. Are you with me? Here's the verse that changes everything in regards to all the books of the Bible between Isaiah and Malachi and proves my point not that I care about whether I'm right or wrong as far as um, a reputation I have no reputation I could care less if I make a mistake I'll admit it I mean I care I try to do my best to in understand prophecy as best I can but if I make a mistake I'll admit it but look what this here we here's my point during these 26 verses prior to it and the discussion of the king of Babylon coming against the land, brothers and sisters, nine out of every ten Bible prophecy teachers thinks this is a history lesson about the days of King Nebuchadnezzar in Israel, uh, in, in Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem going into captivity for 70 years. See, that's what they think, right? Here we go, verse 19, talking about the king of Babylon. Right? Well, you get to verse 27, the last verse in this section about phase one of the day of the Lord. Look what it says. Overthrown, overthrown. I will make it overthrown. Talking about the fall of Jerusalem. It shall be no longer. Now, brothers and sisters, what does that mean? It says, it shall be no longer until. That means that there'll be no more Israelis right or 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 from the tribe of judah or any other tribe israel will no longer own jerusalem and live in jerusalem after this fall of jerusalem until right the one who it belongs to comes now brothers and sisters if you were to read this right here in any other version of the Bible, the Trinity, a member of the Trinity that's mentioned here, would not be capitalized. And that would make it hard to understand or to catch as you're reading. But because I use the New King James Version, and they always get members of the Trinity capitalized correctly, it jumps out at you who this He is. Until he, capital H, comes whose right it is, and I, right, Father, will give it to him. All right? Who? Jerusalem will be given to Jesus. So the healing, the restoration, the ownership of Jerusalem will never be owned by the people of Israel or the tribe of Judah ever again until Jesus comes after this fall of Jerusalem. And you might say, are you saying that this fall of Jerusalem mentioned in Ezekiel 21 by the king of Babylon is the fall of Jerusalem in Zechariah 14? And I say yes, and then you would follow it up with, well, it's sure. So we're only talking about a few days after it falls before the one comes who it belongs to? And the answer is yes. This isn't talking about years between the fall of Jerusalem mentioned here and the coming of the one who it belongs to. That's part of his inheritance. See, we're not talking about years. We're talking about days during the bowls of wrath. You, you see what I mean? Like, for example... Um, Jerusalem probably falls within the time frame of the sixth bowl. But at the seventh bowl, which is a few days after it falls, 
Jesus comes. So to better understand that, you would go back to Zechariah 14. When Jesus goes forth right here to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty, right, which you see right here in Zechariah 14, what happens be right before he comes? Jerusalem falls, it shall be taken, half of the city shall go into captivity. Okay, so it takes a few days when the enemy breaks through the siege wall and decides to start taking captives or killing who they want to kill. And, and, and right here is talking about the raping of the women, thousands and thousands of women being raped all at the same time crying out to the Lord, please send the Messiah, please send the Messiah, right? So you see, we're only talking about a few days, enough time for half of the city to be led away in, on the back of pickup trucks and deuce and halves and five tons, and they're being taken away with the purpose of being sold off, just like the rest of Israel was being sold off uh, a few months and a year or two earlier. Okay, so we're only talking a few days, but brothers and sisters, you see why, right? This, this cannot, see this? This cannot be during the days of King Nebuchadnezzar because Israel got Jerusalem back, right? 70 years uh, later. And this cannot be during the time of 70 AD. Okay, Be why? Because Israel got Jerusalem back. They got Israel back, most of it, in 1948. But they didn't get Jerusalem back until 1967. Okay? But my point is, it can't be 70 AD that's, that's being spoken of here in regards to the fall of Jerusalem. Why? Because... Ye decades before Jesus comes back, Israel got it back. My point is this. This is choice three of the three choices I gave you. This is the 70th week of Daniel, day of the Lord's fall of Jerusalem. Now that you understand that, and I hope I've convinced 99% of you of that, I hope you just sit back in your chair now, especially if you're somebody who really studies prophecy and go, I have gotten that wrong for years. I had no idea this fall of Jerusalem in Ezekiel 21 is our near future. And my children and I will see this and maybe even experience it and the results from it. Okay? Now what you got to do is you come back to this and you go to verse 19 and you go, Well, who is this king of Babylon if it's not? Um, King Nebuchadnezzar. And all you got to do is keep reading Ezekiel, and he finally gives you your answer. And I showed you in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's Gog of Magog in the last days, during the day of the Lord, time of Jacob's trouble. This last war on Israel by all of its evil neighbors. This king of Babylon is the one mentioned in Nahum 1. Verse 11, it's the one who's mentioned, he's the vile one that's also mentioned in Daniel eleven twenty one, 21. Nahum 1, 11 and Daniel eleven twenty one, The Gog of Magog, that's who this is. And all this section, oh, uh, and then when you, again, don't forget that when you come down here to verse 28, this is about the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jordan receives its punishment, right? The people of Ammon, uh, Moab, Edom, um, that's during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath. All right, you know who that is. It's Jesus. Isaiah 30, Isaiah 33, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's end this with this. You need to go back and start reading from Isaiah to Malachi all over again. Because what you're going to find out when you're reading about the king of Assyria, right? In the early chapters of Isaiah, you're actually talking about Gog of Magog, who is not yet 
king of Babylon, but he's king of an Assyrian caliphate. That's why Isaiah calls him the king of Assyria within 65 years, right? Remember Isaiah 7's first prophecy from 1967 to 2032? Go back and look at the prophecies of Isaiah 7. There are two of them. And followed up with in Isaiah 8 with a prophecy that matches the second prophecy in Isaiah 7, which matches the prophecy in Isaiah 32. Brothers and sisters, you need to put on your 70th week of Daniel goggles. Put them on when you read prophecies between Isaiah and Malachi to include the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is all about the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what Lamentations is about, the time of Jacob's trouble. Future, not a past, fall or chastisement of Israel. You want to know what Gog of Magog is going to do? Brothers and sisters, go back and read Ezekiel. All right, go back and read. Hallelujah. But yes, brothers and sisters, that is the verse that changes everything. So what do I mean by that? It changes the way that we view the prophecies between Isaiah and Malachi. It changes everything. All these past kings that attacked Israel in the past, we think of King Sennacherib, King Sargon, we think of King Nebuchadnezzar. But what you don't realize, this is about the future. right? Father uses the playbook of the past to give you the playbook of the future. Because we are the generation that has to face Satan face to face. And we must overcome him. Okay, but that does. If you truly understand what that means, it shall be no longer until. Okay, that should blow your mind. If you, if you really study prophecy or 70th week of Daniel prophecies, that should blow your mind to go, that's the verse I've been looking for. Now I can go back to my brothers and sisters and go, wait a minute, I wasn't being naive and thinking all of these, what appears to be history lessons of Israel's past chastisements. And I've said that, no, this is about the future. And then people come and they tell you, no, you're wrong. You're getting a little carried away. This is all about the past. This is the piece of ammunition you need in your We'll call it a toolbox to be nice. You need to keep this verse at your hip, ready to whip out when somebody tells you, no, brother, that's talking about, you know, 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. No. Whip this verse out and go, okay, who's this king of Babylon? So hopefully I've not only strengthened your faith, but I've strengthened your position on that these prophecies are about the appointed time of the end. And I've given you the ammunition that you need to be bold when you proclaim it. Hallelujah. One last thing, then we're going to say goodbye. And that is, not permanently goodbye, just for a day or two. Um, I've created a Word document for you on this verse that changes everything. The verse that changes everything... We thought we knew about prophecy. Ezekiel 21, 27. It's a two and a half page document. I typed it up this morning. These are my thoughts this morning on this short study. And I will upload this to my 70th week of Daniel folder that I keep with the folks at Keep and Share. Okay. And if you want it, you can uh, download it. Everything's free. Alphabetized two page listing of all my 300 and plus prophecies on the uh, short studies on the 70th week of Daniel. I hope it's a blessing to you. Brothers and sisters, until I see you again, God bless.